I wish good morning to everyone. Firstly, I would like to say thank you to Asia Society for this invitation to talk about Malaysia, the new Malaysia. Malaysia is not always new, it's been quite old in terms of a newly independent country. We have uh, never experienced any change. We love the party which won us the independence so much that we keep on re-electing uh, <laughs> that party. <laughs> Incidentally, I was the pre president of that party for 22 years. Uh, but uh, I decided that 22 years was long enough. I re resigned, although I have been known as a dictator. Uh, <laughs> But uh, I don't think many dictators have resigned. <laughs> no, the more strange thing is that having been criticized by the opposition for 61 years, or for a long time, over 50 over years, uh, they decided that they should shoot, choose me as their leader. <laughs> it is really a contradiction. They used to call me a dictator, a, a very unjust leader, and all kinds of, of other names. But after I resigned, uh, they, uh, they had no difficulty accepting me uh, to lead them. And it is their decision to uh, name me as the uh, uh, prospective uh, leader and uh, prime minister of Malaysia. Actually, we never thought we were going to win. We thought we were going to lose. So we prepared a very long manifesto because we think the manifesto would embarrass the, the, the government, which we thought would be the, the BN government. Uh, but we now find it uh, embarrassing because we have to fulfill all the nasty things. <laughs> that we put into the manifesto. <laughs> Still, we are managing. Um, and uh, when we won, uh, we thought there would be problems. Uh, there would have been problems if we had won by a small majority. But we won uh, by a very big, a big majority, not, not a two-thirds majority, but a very big majority, which uh, I think uh, caught the previous government uh, uh, and they, they were hardly able to react to this situation. Uh, there were many delays in announcing the, the opposition's uh, scores, but eventually they had to accept that uh, the opposition their opposition had won, and uh, they gave in rather uh, nicely without any uh, attempt to frustrate us. There were some, some things happening in the background. Uh, they were trying to form some kind of coalition with a few other parties, including the Islamic party, with the idea that they could uh, achieve a certain uh, majority and set up uh, an Islamic uh, government. But I think in that they fail because Malaysians uh, are very pragmatic and they don't, they don't like to have uh, some radical changes taking place in the country. And so we formed the new government. Uh, we, we call ourselves Pakatan Harapan. Uh, it is a coalition of hope, and now we are we are the government. And uh, the first thing we have to do, of course, is to solve some of the problems created by the previous government. Uh, mainly, it is uh, the uh, financial situation. The previous government borrowed huge sums of money, uh, some of which was used uh, for proposed uh, railway lines. Uh, high-speed rail, etc. But uh, we w realized that we would not be able to pay the debt. 
and the, the agreements that were made with foreign contractors was unfavorable for Malaysia. Uh, so because of that, uh, we, went, we wanted to get out of that uh, contract. And uh, of course, that's not easy. Uh, contracts uh, can be terminated if both sides agree. But if one side only wants to uh, uh, throw out the contract, then uh, the other side would be quite resistant. Still, uh, we are trying, and uh, at the moment, we feel that the other side, the contractor's side, and the country where they come from, China, uh, are not too happy, but also uh, not objecting too, too strongly. Uh, on both the East Coast Railway, which would cost us uh, 55 billion Malaysian ringgit, uh, one Malaysian, uh, four Malaysian, or four Malaysian ringgit would be equal to one US dollar. And also for the high speed rail, uh, a distance of about 200 kilometers. And a high speed train uh, with that short distance doesn't really save any time. So we decided that it's not, both uh, projects were not viable, and we are negotiating to either terminate or uh, maybe reduce the scope or postpone to a later date. We are in the process of negotiating with them. Uh, so far, there have been no absolute rejection of our proposal. So we hope we can uh, avoid having to raise huge sums of money for these railways, which will be borrowed uh, from the contracting company, uh, uh, country, and uh, it will be a great burden on us. Yeah. Also, the borrowings by the previous government amounted to well over one trillion Malaysian ringgit. Uh, the one trillion is a number that Malaysians are not familiar with. We had to explain to them that it means 1,000 billion. <laughs> and uh, we could uh, perhaps raise a few billions, but to, raise, uh, to find 1 trillion uh, ringgit is uh, tough for us. We never borrowed that much before. Uh, still, we are doing our best to reduce the amount that we have to pay, reduce the borrowings, and I think uh, uh, we would be able, over a period of a short period of maybe one or two years, we would be able to reduce the borrowings to a reasonable amount, which uh, the country can service and uh, repay the loan. But apart from that, the previous government also uh, disrupted the administrative machinery. Uh, of course, in our system, like in other democratic uh, countries, uh, the, we, the powers given to the uh, legislative, executive, and the judiciary are separate. Uh, the, ex the executive has uh, to take orders from the elected government, uh, but it is limited, of course, to implementing projects and programs and the like. But uh, what has happened now is that over the last uh, five, or ten, five or ten years, the uh, administrative, administrative uh, organization has been subverted in the sense that they are now a part of the party of the previous government. Uh, they even campaigned during the elections. They wear the shirts, uh, blue shirts, of the BN party, and they were active in supporting the BN party, especially among the senior members. Uh, of course, uh, this is not something that we can live with, we have to change. So we spend a lot of time uh, well, either removing or putting in cold storage many of those who are openly supporting the previous government, and we have to replace with new people. 
Uh, in the government itself, we have to choose from among the more junior members. Unfortunately, the junior members are not well versed in administration, so we have a tough time trying to carry out the administration of the country. But uh, there are also many institutions and companies belonging to the government, uh, which in the past were managed by party members from the BN party. But now we have decided that we should uh, let uh, professional people manage all these institutions and uh, companies. Uh, that is going on quite well. We have identified uh, people who are not uh, committed to any party, who are mainly in, the bu in business or uh, heading some other organizations uh, which are not committed to the previous government. Uh, we had a tough time trying to organize the campaigns against the previous government because uh, uh, the government has a habit of um, punishing anybody who donates uh, money to the opposition. Uh, in fact, uh, we won this opposition with uh, less than one-tenth of what the uh, government party spent. Uh, we learned how to be lean in terms of our campaign. And uh, in fact, uh, although the government has this slogan that cash is king, <laughs> practically admitting to the world that bribery is okay. <laughs> so uh, we had, to, uh, they, they were spending huge sums of money giving to the, uh, to the voters. <clears throat> we couldn't do that. We didn't have the money. But uh, it seems that the voters uh, have got strong feelings about getting rid of the government. So between, uh, with uh, the strong feeling against the government, uh, they, despite receiving the money, they would receive the money, but they would not vote for the government party. So uh, cash is king is not really uh, correct because people can uh, accept money, but that doesn't mean that they will uh, be obedient to the cash. Uh, they, they, uh, we, it's quite obvious that despite the millions spent uh, on the electorate and on uh, party leaders, uh, they perform very badly. So because of the feelings of the, of the voters, uh, we, we won. Of course, uh, we were fortunate in being able to bring together four opposition parties in, into a coalition. And at the very last uh, minute, uh, our party was uh, declared as uh, illegal, which means that uh, we couldn't contest. Uh, and then we couldn't form the coalition. The coalition also was made illegal, but uh, that was okay. We decided we'll use one uh, flag, one logo, one symbol uh, of one of the parties in the coalition. And effectively, we contested the election as a coalition against the government coalition. So it was almost a two-party contest. And uh, because of the uh, strength or, or the support that we had from the people for the opposition parties, uh, we won the election. So now it is a, a problem of uh, uh, overcoming some of the uh, wrongdoings of the previous government. We have decided to go back to democracy, to the rule of law, and to all those things that are associated with democracy. Uh, this was not... <laughs> yeah, we have always claimed ourselves to be democratic before, <laughs> because uh, some people uh, uh, do, not, do not think we were democrat democratic before. But I would like to claim that when I was leading the country, we were democratic. 
uh, my my argument, of course, is that if uh, I'm a dictator, I wouldn't have resigned. <laughs> so we are now going back to democracy, to the rule of law. And of course, the rule of law is uh, very uh, uh, tedious, very uh, time-consuming. Uh, we have to take action against the previous government and its leader, the Prime Minister. But to do that, we have to abide by the needs of providing proper evidence in the court of law. So it has been quite some time before he was uh, actually charged in court. But we want to adhere to the rule of law, even if it is an inconvenience and even if uh, the result may not be what we want. But I'm pretty sure that we have enough evidence uh, to, for the courts to accept uh, our charge, I mean the government's charge that uh, the previous government was uh, not only undemocratic, but it was uh, guilty of uh, uh, corruption and it was also guilty of uh, uh, stealing government money, not small amounts. Uh, we like to be famous, of course. Uh, we like to be well-known in the world. But today we are well-known for the biggest uh, money laundering effort ever made by any nation anyway. So that will go down in history also. But uh, uh, trying to get back the money is a big problem for us. We are slowly confiscating whatever we could. Uh, the latest one, we confiscated a yacht, which is 300 feet long, or 100 meters long, very big yacht, and uh, it's now in Malaysia. Uh, of course, uh, it is claimed by Joe Lowe that it is his yacht. That is fine, he can claim. He can come back to Malaysia and, <laughs> and make his claim. Of course, we have also a claim on him. He comes back to Malaysia, he will be arrested. So at the moment, he is somewhere around in the world. I believe he has quite a number of passports. Uh, so he can still move around and maybe live in countries where there are no extradition rights uh, uh, with, with Malaysia. But uh, I would like to say that uh, we have great hopes uh, for the country to be resuscitated. And uh, we want, all, as always, to be uh, business friendly. We are keen to invite foreigners to come and uh, invest in Malaysia. Of course, Malaysians too invest in Malaysia. Although sometime, for some time now they have been investing abroad, but we want them to invest in Malaysia and foreign investors are welcome to invest in Malaysia. Uh, we know a few things about developing the economy and I think we'll apply our knowledge to uh, help the country recover economically and also politically. Uh, politically, now the people recognize that this government is not corrupt. So far there has been no reports or we, well, not true, two of the members of the government party, yeah, not, not prominent leaders, were caught uh, uh, receiving bribes and they have been charged in court. But otherwise, uh, the corruption level is uh, very, very low. We, we do not hear much about corruption now in Malaysia. Uh, the government machinery is moving quite smoothly, uh, we will uh, re-adopt the concept of uh, Malaysia Incorporated, uh, which means that Malaysia is a corporation in which the private sector and the government work closely together to ensure that the corporation uh, succeeds and uh, delivers uh, to the people. So th these are the things that we are doing. And if there are any questions, uh, I would be happy to answer. Thank you. Well, Prime Minister, thank you for that um, 
bravura performance. Uh, I've uh, been here at the Asia Society for some time now. And uh, very few occasions have I seen a head of government or a head of state uh, stand and deliver uh, a 30-minute uh, speech without a single note. That's <laughs> quite remarkable. Uh, as uh, Tom Nagorski said before, in many parts of the world, now, we regard you as the patron saint of political comeback. Uh, it's a remarkable achievement. Uh, your campaign, uh, those of us in the region watched it very closely. But as you said, uh, it uh, requires a lot of uh, hard work. Your stamina is quite extraordinary. I mean, as Tom said, you're 93. Uh, many of us stand in awe of that. What's your secret to such health? <laughs> I think everyone wants to know the answer to that question, right? <laughs> well, I get this question asked practically anywhere I, I go or speak. Uh, people just wonder, I myself wonder why. <laughs> because I don't really know. Uh, I have been fortunate in that I uh, did not suffer from uh, diseases that are incurable. Yeah. Uh, I've had uh, two heart operations, and, but beyond that, uh, I'm quite well. I have occasional cough, but I have my doctor following me everywhere I go. <laughs> and, but uh, a reasonably moderate life style. I don't eat very much. I, I don't eat until I grow fat. Uh, and uh, I don't drink, I don't smoke. Uh, I do a little bit of exercise. Uh, but I believe that uh, a person must be active. Yeah. Uh, if a person after retirement decides to just rest, mm. his body will, will, uh, will uh, refuse to perform. You, you become very weak. Even if you don't think, if you don't think, don't solve problems, you don't read, that also affects your brain. So keep active, keep mobile, keep problem solving, and we're going to get the name and contact telephone number of your doctor. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be good publicity for him or her. The, uh, well, welcome again to the Asia Society. Uh, we did some checking before. You were last here in 2003. Uh, which was near your, the end of your first term as Prime Minister. Uh, and we, the Asia Society, uh, regard you as a friend uh, and uh, that you have uh, been such a distinguished leader of your country for so long and now you've returned to the task. I listened carefully, PM, to what you said before about the challenges you, knew, you now face. Uh, as you said, pre-election commitments can be difficult. Uh, when you have to implement them all. But I listened particularly to what you said about rebuilding the independence of the civil service. Um, perhaps you could reflect on that a little further. My own judgment is that a professional, uh, independent public service or civil service is so fundamental to the success of any of our democracies. So perhaps you could uh, reflect further on your plans to rebuild the independence of the civil service. Yeah. Well, we were a colony before. And fortunately... The so are we. Mm. <laughs> fortunately, the British... But we were in jail as well, so it's different. <laughs> <laughs> well, you beat my record. <laughs> anyway, uh, the British left uh, a, a reasonable number of people who are family of with administration, yeah. and we took over after independence quite easily, and we followed the same uh, uh, practice that is found in the UK. Uh, that is that uh, the civil service should uh, take orders from the elected government, but only with regard to the administration of the country. Yeah. Uh, but what happened, of course, under <coughs> the previous uh, Prime Minister is that the civil service became totally subservient to the uh, elected government. Uh, they were prepared to even commit crimes, obvious crimes, uh, because they were ordered to. And this, of course, was not good for the country. Uh, for example, uh, 
the reports made against Najib was put in under Official Secrets Act, which means that the public cannot read mm. even the uh, Public Accounts Committee's report. And this is uh, wrong because uh, the, those reports constitute evidence, and hiding evidence is criminal. And yet, the AG was prepared to hide uh, under this Official Secrets Act. So we find that we could no longer trust the administration. Mm. Uh, now it, the process of trying to recover is uh, very tricky because we need people with experience, but the people with experience were the culprits. Uh, so we need to have... Uh, <laughs> not all, though. <laughs> Our ambassador here is OK. <laughs> but uh, very many of them. Ambassador, you're safe. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, I, I think uh, the, it's e fairly easy for them to go back to the old pattern yeah. of uh, being administrators who will take orders from the elected government, but those or orders would be limited to administrative matters, mm -hmm. uh, not to carry out something that is illegal. I agree with you, um, PM. I mean, the British got many things wrong over the years, but Whitehall and the professionalism of the civil service has been one of their great strengths when we've sought to replicate it in our respective countries. I'm still stunned by your description of the slogan of, uh, of UMNO, uh, cash is king. <laughs> That's some slogan. Yeah. <laughs> it obviously didn't work. It didn't work. But uh, uh, the campaign that you fought uh, I was again struck by the fact that you had very little money uh, and therefore campaigning against a well-funded political organisation like UMNO. And so just tell me, how much did you use social media in your campaign? Well, we have to resort to social media because uh, the main uh, newspapers and the TV station are controlled by the government. They would not uh, report any, anything good about us. If, of course, if we, there is anything bad, they would report uh, over and over again. But uh, the social media allows us to com com uh, connect with the people and tell them and respond to whatever it is that the government says. Uh, we find out that uh, if the government says something that is uh, wrong, for example, uh, they called me by a funny name. What's uh, that, Prime Minister? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all Prime Ministers get called by funny names. <laughs> but uh, but uh, the social media responded very quickly and rejected uh, that, that assertion. And there are many other things that uh, uh, were done. One particular case was when the Prime Minister, Prime Minister said, he doesn't eat rice. He is uh, this uh, South Africa. South... Yeah, well, you know what it is. <laughs> but that is. I don't know what it is. What is it? <laughs> yeah, this green coming from South America, oh, I see. which is about 25 times more costly than rice. Oh, I see. That was the he nature of the he, attack. When yeah. he said that, of course, the response is oh, well, you can afford. The people down there cannot afford even to buy rice because the price of rice has gone up. Yeah. So the social media help us a lot. That's really uh, important reflection in terms of the criticism and the praise of social media in all of our democracies. But for political parties who don't have cash as king, uh, it's pretty fundamental to getting your message out. Now, Prime Minister, we were talking before about beyond politics in Malaysia uh, some of the continuing challenges you have in internal security. Would you like to elaborate on that further? Well, uh, we are 60% Muslim. Mm. Fortunately for us, uh, Muslims in Malaysia are not extreme uh, in their views or in their practice. But we have a Muslim party, an Islamic party, and they tend to resort to um, Islamic reasons for what they call Islamic reasons for whatever it is that they uh, did. Even though what they did is against the teachings of Islam, they still claim that it is uh, 
the Islamic thing to do. Uh, we have to counter that. And to counter that, you have to also know your religion. You will have to tell them that, look, what they're saying is not correct because the religion or the Quran says a different thing. Mm. So we counter not by saying, well, oh, now it's uh, modern times, uh, you know, you can practice all those things. That wouldn't uh, go down well with the Muslims. But when we point out to the Muslim people in Malaysia that what the Muslim party is saying is completely contradictory to what is in the Quran, then we are accepted. So we have been able to uh, reduce the support for the Islamic party and uh, they uh, could never win uh, to become the government at the federal level, though they may win at the state level. Uh, the other thing is, of course, uh, Malaysians now, through again through the social media, uh, gain access to teachings outside the country. Uh, so quite a few uh, Malays, M Muslim, have uh, left the country to join IS ISIS, and uh, uh, some of them have been killed. But this is a small minority, and if we catch them before they go, uh, we have to uh, teach them again what actually is the teachings of Islam. So, um, in terms of returning fighters from um, Syria uh, and from elsewhere in the Middle East, I mean, Indonesians have a challenge, you have a challenge, we have a challenge with some of our Muslim communities in Australia. And so, your strategy of countering militant Islamism or, or, or violent extremism, you see this as a big priority for your government for the period ahead? Uh, yes, it is. Uh, there is still a law which enables us to detain these people, uh, no, no charges against them, but just detaining them and trying to uh, disabuse their, uh, their beliefs. Uh, we tell them that it is not actually, not Islamic, it's even against the teachings of Islam, uh, which uh, they, what, uh, what they were doing. And to a certain extent, we managed to uh, convert them back to the uh, uh, general beliefs of the country. Good. Now, PM, how are relations going with the neighbours? Um, we had the Singaporean uh, foreign minister here last night. I know you've always had a colourful relationship with, uh, with Singapore. <laughs> Not as colourful as your relationship with Australia, but, uh, but, uh, but tell me, how are things going with the neighbours? I see uh, Lee Sien Long has been chatting to you recently. How's it going? Well, whether we like it or not, uh, Singapore is just next door. It's very close to us. <laughs> in fact, a big number of the people in uh, Singapore are Malaysians. They find it, uh, well, better to live there because their incomes are much higher than in Malaysia. But uh, we still have uh, issues that we need to settle. Uh, among the issues would be the the price of raw water. Uh, way back in 1926, a long time ago, the price was fixed at three cents per thousand gallons of raw water. The British did that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they insist that they should pay three cents. Now, three cents cannot buy anything at all. So, but this is the cheapest source of water. And uh, for Singapore, of course, if they try to desalinate, it costs a lot of money. Yeah. So we have been trying to revise the price, but uh, uh, we have not been successful. And there are also other issues uh, between us which have not been settled. So we will continue to talk to them. We'll not go to war with them. <laughs> I think there's been... We're well past that in our history, so... Uh... Uh, now, the, the rest of the neighbourhood, um, in ASEAN, you have been a major figure in ASEAN over the years. My own view of ASEAN as uh, an outsider has been, despite many people criticising it for being weak, it's been, uh, in my view, a huge strength in the region uh, in turning former adversaries into partners. Uh, it's not just uh, Indonesia, Singapore, Malaysia, but 
former communist and currently con communist Indochina. And it, and it works. So give me your sense of ASEAN's future, given the current challenges. ASEAN uh, has great potential. Uh, the population of ASEAN is about 600 million. Mm. It's about half that of uh, China. Although they are poor, but still the numbers count. So we feel that if we can um, uh, open up our countries to trade uh, with these uh, 600 million people, ASEAN itself will grow. We've tried uh, to set up uh, heavy industries, uh, allocating to each uh, ASEAN member one industry. Uh, however, that did not uh, happen. Uh, Malaysia did. Malaysia and uh, Indonesia set up fertilizer plants, uh, which are very useful. But the other states somehow or other couldn't get on with uh, implementing the, 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 the industries that is identified for them. But still, uh, the fact remains that trade within ASEAN, between ASEAN countries, has grown. And a lot of our, our trade is with ASEAN countries. Mm. Uh, although now we, we, we trade a lot with China and also the rest of the world. Malaysia is a trading nation. Uh, we, we trade with everybody, irrespective of their ideology or religion. Mm. We trade with them and we want to maintain friendly relations. Uh, sometimes there can be some problems, but we believe that all problems can be resolved through negotiation arbitration or a court of law. So, so far that has worked out uh, in the ASEAN countries. Uh, it was set up actually to avoid confrontations. Yeah. That was what happened initially. Mm. But uh, we felt that confrontation, wars, will not benefit anybody. So ASEAN has been a very peaceful regional organization for a very long time. And it has survived. Many other regional uh, organizations have failed or have faded away, but uh, ASEAN has remained. And I think uh, one of the problems now is that uh, we change leaders. At one time in the, in the early days, uh, the, the leaders were the same. They meet uh, Kuan Yu, myself, and uh, Sohatlo. Uh, we know each other, so we can always uh, sit down and talk as friends. Hmm. But now, of course, um, because we want democracy, we have to change leaders. <laughs> and each time we go, we meet strangers, and it takes time to uh, work with strangers. Democracy can be troublesome. <laughs> yes, yes, I've said so Good, many times. Good, but troublesome. <laughs> the, um, you've just mentioned uh, China as a significant economic partner, probably now the major economic partner of Malaysia. It certainly is for my country, and I think uh, most countries in East Asia. You've recently been to Beijing. Uh, I've looked carefully at uh, the negotiations of various contracts between the Chinese and, uh, and Malaysia under the previous government. You've um, uh, reviewed a number of those. A number are continuing, and some have been, uh, as it were, shelved. So before we get into the bilateral relationship, in Beijing you met Xi Jinping and uh, with Li Keqiang. Uh, give me your sense of Xi Jinping, the man that you met, uh, as he is a man with a vision for his country. Um, more than any other Chinese leader uh, since uh, Mao Zedong, Xi Jinping has a much stronger uh, 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 belief in nationalism, in making China a great country. So he comes up with a lot of ideas, including the one bell, one road, and he is uh, pushing China to become the, the great industrial country that it, it can be. Already they have made tremendous progress and they are very rich because uh, their people are very good in business and uh, now the world is their market. So they are able to produce almost anything uh, that others can produce. Uh, maybe later on even airplanes uh, would be produced by China. And uh, they, Xi Jinping is someone, a nationalist to the core. 
he wants to uh, build a greater China. Mm. So he sometimes uh, he may rub off uh, wrongly on other people, but for him, China must be a great power. Of course, given your vast experience as a Malaysian statesman um, and a regional statesman, the, uh, you would have met uh, Deng Xiaoping uh, in your earlier time as uh, Prime Minister. Uh, have you made any reflections or observations about the similarities or differences between Xi Jinping and Deng Xiaoping? Well, Deng Xiaoping was leading at the time when China was very poor. He came to Malaysia. At that time, I was a Deputy Prime Minister. Uh, he wanted to ask about how Malaysia progressed. Mm. So the Prime Minister asked me to have a chat with him. Uh, he asked all kinds of questions about uh, development. At that time, China was, uh, was not yet industrialized. Uh, some of the questions I could answer, some like, uh, how many tons of steel do you produce? I had to confess, <laughs> I didn't know. It's a very Chinese yeah. question. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, all the time he was focused on developing uh, China. Yeah. And it is he who changed completely the system yeah. uh, to allow more uh, capital to be used for development. But uh, Xi Jinping is inherited a China that is almost fully developed. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is a developed country, though it is still uh, considered to be a third world country because of the uh, per capita income. But China has got uh, more modern facilities like high-speed train and the like than most other developed countries. And he wants to make China a great country. Mm. So he's working on, he's uh, far more uh, dedicated than uh, uh, Deng Xiaoping. On the bilateral relationship between Malaysia and China, uh, would have been a big focus of your visit in Beijing. Uh, what opportunities do you see? Uh, what constraints do you see for the future? We see a rich China as a big market. 1.4 billion people, even with a small income, would still be a big market. So we can sell things to China, uh, huge amounts of things to China, including raw materials and the like. Uh, at the moment, we are exporting some manufactured goods uh, to China, electronics and all that, but we also receive some of their manufactured goods here in Malaysia. Generally, China provides a big market. It is also a source for cheap uh, products, now of high quality. Initially, their motor vehicles were not of high quality, but now they have mastered the technology and they are producing good quality cars and they are cheap. And a lot of things that they produce would be very cheap. And in fact, uh, most countries would ask China to produce the products that they have uh, invented. So in a way, China is helping to keep prices low in almost the whole world. And of course, uh, ASEAN has had a um, long discussion, sometimes disagreement, sometimes confrontation with China over the South China Sea. Um, and this is a complex matter. The previous government of the Philippines took China to the International Court of Justice. The determination was delivered by the ICJ in favor of uh, the Philippines. Um, how do you see uh, the South China Sea evolving uh, in the context of ASEAN-China relations? Well, it all uh, is about the strength, the power of China. I mean, Malaysia has lived with China for maybe 2,000 years. We have been trading with them, collecting jungle products to, in exchange for lacquer ware and the like. Um, but uh, they have not uh, tried to conquer us. Uh, of course, because the China, South China Sea mentions China as part of its name, uh, China claims that it is uh, part of China. Uh, it's all right for them to claim. Uh, we can't go to war against them because they claim. What is important to us is uh, passage of uh, ships, uh, vessels through South China Sea and the Straits of Malacca. Uh, for us, the sea must be open because uh, we trade a lot. We, uh, Malaysia, Malaysia's trading is very big. 
and uh, we need the sea. Mm. So long as they don't disturb the passage of ships, we are, we are okay with that, with whatever claim they may make. Uh, because we don't agree on the basis of the claim, but uh, what can we do? We are a small country. Malaysia, Malaysia, Malaysia states have always been very small. They have always learned how to live with big neighbours. Mm. We used to send uh, silver flowers, gold flowers to them, <laughs> and we survived. <laughs> the, uh, I wonder how the Singaporeans would reflect on that with you. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we'll come back to that later on. The, um, you've also been uh, uh, talking in recent times about the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, uh, one Belt, One Road. Uh, uh, what's your view of China's grand strategy there and how it affects Malaysia and Southeast Asia? Yeah, before, before China adopted this new ideology of theirs, I have actually suggested that China build a railway line from China to the west uh, by building bigger trains with bigger, uh, wider tracks. I pointed out before that um, when the demand for oil grew in the Far East, ships were built which were bigger and bigger until they were almost half a million tons. Uh, but the trains have remained the same size. Uh, the modern technology should enable uh, bigger trains, longer trains to be built, and that will speed up movements of goods and, and people across uh, cent uh, Central Asia. Uh, but I didn't talk about, about the shipping part of it because I thought that as far as shipping is concerned, they were already be building big ships, mm. big tankers and all that. But uh, the idea is not new to us. Mm. We have also suggested before that we should have a train that links uh, Kunming in the south of China to Singapore. Mm. Already the line is there, but it is narrow gauge and mm. it's not quite suitable, but still it provides a, a good communication uh, between China and Southeast Asia. Mm. Uh, so these are not something, it's, uh, new ideas. These are ideas which um, Xi Jinping uh, now translate into one belt, one road. He's not only thinking about the land route, the old Silk Road, but also through the sea. And of course, China needs a free passage of goods to and fro uh, in, in the sea as well as on land, because China must depend on raw materials coming from outside. There's been some reaction, including in Sri Lanka, about um uh, too much debt associated with uh, One Belt, One Road uh, projects, and we've followed the debate about the port in Sri Lanka. Um, what's your own view about, uh, about that? Uh, I know you've had some reflections on it in terms of the level of prospective debt which might be associated with some of the bigger Chinese infrastructure projects in Malaysia. Yeah, in the past we developed Malaysia without borrowing too much. Uh, we know that if we borrow and we cannot pay, it puts us in a very difficult position. But uh, this late, the last government uh, was, uh, seems to like big projects, mm. costing a lot of money. And uh, they were the ones who, Malaysian leaders were the ones who proposed. Uh, maybe they were urged by the Chinese, I don't know. But anyway, it was the Prime Minister who suggested the high-speed rail as well as the East Coast Rail and uh, also LRT, MRT in Kuala Lumpur, all of which uh, cost billions of dollars, which we could not afford. Uh, we should not uh, go into that, uh, into this, but the worst thing to happen is that these projects depended almost entirely on borrowing money mm. and borrowing large sums of money. So the fall is with the Malaysian government of course, the Chinese contractors, if you want to give them a job, a big job, they will take. And if you cannot pay, then you have to face the penalty for not paying. So we... The, the asset going. Yeah. Mm. 
So we, th we think that uh, we are negotiating now, not because of China's uh, mistake or false, uh, but because of uh, our government entered into, um, uh, started a project projects which we cannot afford. We should live within our means. We were able to develop Malaysia quite well before without borrowing huge sums of money. I'll be moving to questions from the audience in a few minutes. But before I do so, we've been talking about uh, one great power called um, China. Uh, we're now in the, uh, the bosom of another great power. It's called the United States. Um, how's it going with the Trump administration? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, we didn't feel the opposition in those days were not quite happy that Trump received uh, the uh, corrupt prime minister of Malaysia. Mm -hmm. We thought uh, people should at least avoid seeing him, but uh, he met Trump and he, uh, in his usual way, he offered to bribe Trump. <laughs> he wanted to buy airplanes and all that, and even to give money to the United States. I mean, it's ridiculous. Malaysia is poor and is trying to help the United States, which is about the richest country in the world. But uh, cash, that is... Cash is king. <laughs> cash is king, yeah. <laughs> That's what he thinks. By now, I think he realized that cash is not king. So that was his kind of relation. But we are, at this moment, we have not uh, proposed any uh, proper strategy or ways of uh, dealing with the United States. Because we are still trying to figure out what is it that the, Prime, the President of the United States wants? Because sometimes he changes his mind three times a day, and that's a bit deep unsettling for us. I could take that conversation in many directions. But uh, on the, you mentioned before that uh, Malaysia uh, is a great trading nation in history and the present. Um, and of course, we're now in the midst of an unfolding trade war between the United States and China with some capacity to affect the global economy, given the size which that bilateral trade represents as a proportion of global GDP. Um, your thoughts on uh, how this may evolve uh, and your broader thoughts on, let's call it, uh, the free trade rules under the World Trade Organization. We believe that wars are not productive, whether it be at the usual arms-based uh, wars or it is trade wars, it's not productive. In the end, both countries will have to pay a price. Mm. But unfortunately, other countries which are not involved will also have to pay a price. Mm. Uh, of course, uh, in the, the US will apply sanctions. Uh, and we, when it does this, even countries which had no problem with the US have to obey and are not trade with the countries that has been sanctioned by the U.S. Uh, we hope that this will come to an end very quickly mm. and uh, we will be able to regain in, in time uh, after the damage caused by the trade war. Well, ladies and gentlemen, um, we have some time for some questions from the audience. So um, if you, uh, we have folks with microphones, they'll pass them along to you. Um, uh, can I ask that when you ask your question, simply identify who you are, if you're from by name and organisation, and keep the question short. Uh, if it becomes a statement, uh, or a political statement, I will uh, exercise my prerogative as chair of the meeting, uh, deploying all the tact of Australian diplomacy, um, <laughs> and cut you off. Uh, uh, the gentleman here in the middle, if the mic could be passed to him. Uh, my name is Su Chuan Tan. I'm originally from Malacca, Malaysia. Uh, I now manage an investment firm in Connecticut, uh, but most of my family is still in Malaysia. My heart's still in Malaysia. Thank you what, for what you're doing with Malaysia Baru. Uh, the question for you is this. In your recent speeches, you've discussed the importance of cultivating an independent press in Malaysia, uh, free from political influence and ownership. Uh, how encouraging are you of international investors making investments in Malaysian media companies and playing an active role in their business operations and strategy? Thanks for the question. Yeah. PM. 
Well, we are very familiar with uh, foreign investors coming into Malaysia. In fact, uh, we claim to be a pioneer in that uh, uh, practice because uh, when uh, colonies become independent, they normally do not like foreigners to come into their country. But when Malaysia became independent, we had more foreigners uh, trading, doing business in the country and living in the country than when we were a colony. Because we welcome foreign investment, uh, we feel that foreign investment would help grow the country. And indeed, yeah, it happened that way. Uh, now, of course, uh, people uh, talk about FDI as if it is uh, the usual thing to do. But at one time, FDI was not acceptable to nearly independent countries. But we, are, we, grew, we grew because of FDI. Of course, by now, our own people are quite able to invest uh, in, in, that, in uh, uh, industries uh, that, are, that will supply goods and products to the whole world. So we benefited much from FDI. And we will continue with that. On the future of the media in your country, Prime Minister? Yeah. The media. Media. Yeah, yeah. Oh. The media is free. But of course, freedom is not absolute. If you go around to tell uh, uh, some, we are multiracial. And if you one race starts uh, provoking the other races uh, to the point where there might be conflicts and clashes, uh, we will have to put a stop to that. Otherwise, we are free to report whatever they like, including criticizing the government. Uh, we have uh, allowed that to happen because the opposition, the present opposition, the old government, uh, is still uh, uh, controlling some of the TV stations and the press, and they uh, criticize us. Uh, that is okay. We can reply to their criticism. Foreign investment in the media? The Pol oh, oh, foreign yeah. investment His in the media. touched on that as well. Well, uh, there are not many foreign uh, uh, investment in the media, but some uh, Western papers uh, do publish uh, from uh, Kuala Lumpur before. And if they want to, yeah, they are welcome to publish uh, out of Kuala Lumpur or to invest in the media in Kuala Lumpur. We could give you Rupert Murdoch. It's, uh, <laughs> the, uh, now, there's, uh, it's, it's hard to see from up here, but I like to do a mix of uh, men and women. There's a, a woman here in a green dress. That's, the light here is quite bad, so uh, thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Catherine Heald. I'm a patron of the Asia Society. Can you please comment on the one or more islands that were leased to China that are being built by China for mainland Chinese to live on and I read are being will, will actually be governed by China as well despite being Malaysian land. I think the question is about is it Kuantan? Forestry. There's a Chinese project where there is um, the building of some off offshore islands just off the Malaysian coast so the question was um, how do you feel about the project uh, and will they be subject to a full um, uh, Malaysian sovereignty? Well, we welcome foreign direct investment, including from China. But to us, foreign direct investment involves bringing in capital and technology, setting up plants in Malaysia, employing Malaysians uh, up to the level of executives. That is to us foreign direct investment. But we do not consider um, buying land in Malaysia building uh, very big uh, cities and bringing in foreigners to stay in the city. That is not what we believe to be a foreign direct investment because these uh, people, uh, uh, about 700,000 people are coming from other countries to live in Malaysia. Of course, every country controls immigration. Uh, we see that happening in Europe, we see that happening in, uh, in America, uh, they have put up walls against Mexico and all that. Uh, but uh, Malaysia is just like that. We want our people to 
be involved in whatever is happening in the country, but that we should allow a certain number of foreigners to come and live and even eventually gain citizenship in our country. But when, when we talk about 700,000 and even 1.5 million people coming to live in Malaysia from other countries, I think that's not on. We, we don't encourage that. Good, a further question up here. Uh, the gentleman with the glasses there. Yeah. My question relates, Steve Cartman, I'm an attorney. My question relates to the global economy. There's been some concern in recent months about the fragility of some of the emerging markets, countries such as Turkey and Argentina. You led Malaysia at the time of the last emerging market crisis, uh, the Asian financial crisis. Do you see any parallels between that situation and what's uh, unfolding uh, in the emerging markets now, and do you have any uh, lessons you could draw from that experience that would be relevant today? Thank you. Yeah, it's about the parallels between the Asian financial crisis of 97 when you're in office, PM, and problems now that we're facing in uh, emerging markets. Yeah, <clears throat> the Asian financial crisis of 1997-98 was created by currency traders. They, they can actually buy and sell currencies which they don't even own and depress the value or uh, re revalue the currency. And that is very, uh, that is not good for business. When you don't know the value of the currency, it's very difficult to budget for the whole year. So because of that, uh, we had to take action to take away our currency from the market. We, the market cannot sell or buy our currency. If they do, we will not recognize uh, the, the sale. So that's how we dealt with. And I think uh, some small countries uh, would not be able to do that kind of thing, uh, the, ones, uh, the strategy we adopted. Because we, it, Malaysia has got very big savings. 40% of GDP, the highest uh, savings rate among most countries. Uh, but where, where countries are short of foreign exchange, they don't have enough savings, uh, if you depress their, their currency deliberately, they become very poor. And that's not fair. For people who want to make money out of trading, uh, to depress the uh, value of the currency and impoverish people, that is morally wrong. wrong. Uh, but uh, if the market feels that a currency is now not reflecting the real value, then the market uh, can uh, show their, their, their feelings by not using the currency or using the currency. Uh, then, of course, the currency will remain, uh, will, be, will be reflect the valuation made by the market. But currency traders have got nothing to do with the market. They can deliberately reduce the, uh, the value or increase the value. So uh, small countries uh, find difficulty in uh, uh, dealing with this uh, fluctuation in the value of their currency. It's far better if we don't have currency trading. Currency is not a commodity. You cannot eat it. But uh, you want to price of coffee or sugar, it's okay. But currency should not be traded the way commodities are traded. Let me move to this side of the room here. There is a young woman here. Uh, thank you. If we can see the mic coming in your direction. There you go. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Zijun Tan and I'm a student I'm a Malaysian student here studying in New York. Uh, my question is about how you see human rights progressing in Malaysia, um, especially in terms of children's rights, especially with the rise of child, I mean, the issue, the issue of child marriages being very present in the media these days, um, as well as the issue of LGBTQ rights, um, also with uh, labor, uh, sorry, migrant labor rights. Thank you. <coughs> 
Well, the idea of human rights and the uh, uh, the, ty- the kind of things that constitute uh, human rights is uh, comes out of Western countries, uh, which have a different culture than a lot of the Eastern countries. So while we respect the rights of uh, people, but at the same time we have also to think about our, our, our own moral values. So if they are in conflict with our moral values, we cannot accept them. But we will accept the rights of people to speak as long as they don't provoke people to fight and also the right of people to move around, uh, to have the free press, etc. But there is nothing absolute about human rights. You cannot do certain things, even in Western countries. If, uh, for example, everybody comes to this hall naked, I don't think the Western people appreciate that. (laughs) There are certain things that you just, uh, you see, that thus far and no more. Uh, so we, we may say that more often than Western countries, but we still respect human rights. I have a question here by email uh, from a uh, young guy called uh, Aaron. He says, as part of the TPP, Trans-Pacific Partnership, <laughs> Malaysia pledged significant reforms to labour legislation. Um, that if it stopped, he says, when Trump pulled out of the TPP. Would you, Prime Minister, resume this effort to make changes to Malaysia's labour laws? That's a question we've got online. Well, there is room for some uh, revision in the labour laws of the country. But uh, we, we don't have very many problems with uh, labour in Malaysia. We don't have very many strikes uh, and and the like, and people are not uh, uh, very selective in terms of uh, working. Uh, of course, in some countries, uh, they don't like dirty, dangerous uh, work. But uh, in Malaysia, if we don't like, we import foreign labor. And we treat foreign labor like Malaysian labor. We pay them the same wages. So uh, as far as I can see, we have had very little problem with labor. Relationship between labor and uh, the governments of the country has always been quite good. Uh, I, when I was prime minister, of course, the, my best friends are the, the labor leaders. Now, further question over here. I think there is a, a gentleman here, two from the end. That's you, sir. Yeah. Um, You're three from the end. It was the guy next to you, but that's fine. <laughs> One, two, three. At least in uh, Australia, that's three. Do, do not, they, um, thanks for uh, this talk. Uh, very enjoyable so far. Uh, my name is Jason Goh from Moa Joho, over here. Just over here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Jason Goh from Moa Joho. Um, I was a bit disappointed that you decided uh, not to become education minister. I know you... <laughs> I was a bit disappointed that you decided not to be education minister. I think you, you had thought you, you would like to take up that portfolio. Um, as a kid growing up in Moa, a very small town in Malaysia, one of the things that I think really benefited people like me was the education foundation that we got was tremendous. We, we had good English with an accent, but that's fine. Uh, I went to a SRJK vernacular school, uh, science stream, you know, and, and it set us, a lot of us up for careers uh, outside of Malaysia, you know, for personal reasons, professional reasons. That's all been great. I feel as if education in Malaysia has, is not as good as when we were in school. What are your plans to improve um, education in Malaysia? What are the two, three steps that must be taken? Well, uh we want to make use of English more often because e- English is a uh, universal language. Everybody speaks English, even in countries where English is not a common language, a uh, national language. But beyond that, uh, what we think is that we are, education is too much about imparting knowledge to the young, to the young people so that they can be uh, better, more knowledgeable about whatever subject it is 
that they want to learn. But we feel that the character of the people is very important. Uh, today, uh, in most uh, countries, including Malaysia, uh, parents are not able to uh, teach their children the right values because parents are, both of them, would be working and don't spend quality time with their children. So be in the schools, in the primary classes, in the, in the kindergarten even, we need to impart, uh, to teach uh, children the right values. Otherwise, they will adopt the values they get from their friends, and that may not be suitable for, for their own future or for the society. You see, values uh, uh, play a very big role uh, in the development of society. Uh, if you have good knowledge of certain things, but you make a bad use of that knowledge. Uh, for example, you may learn about nuclear power and you decide that you should build a bomb and kill people. Uh, I mean, you should be told that killing people is wrong, is immoral, should not be done and you shouldn't be involved in that. So the value system uh, of any, any single individual or Society is very important. And since parents are not able to teach their children what is right and what is wrong, what is sinful and what is, gives you merit, etc., uh, then the school system, the educational system, should give some uh, stress on the shaping the character of the people. It's not brainwashing. Uh, after all, when the parents uh, teach their children, that's also a form of brainwashing. But we will have to do uh, not what uh, other countries, some countries do, where they teach the children to love the great leader and things like that. Uh, we are not going to do that. We are going to tell them that stealing is bad. Don't, don't steal. Uh, being trustworthy is good. Is that something wrong? There's nothing wrong with that. So I wanted to revise the curriculum of the uh, educational system in Malaysia, but uh, we had made a promise in our manifesto that the Prime Minister may not hold any other portfolio. So <laughs> I, I have to give it to somebody else, but I am in close contact with him. <laughs> I'm not sure I'd like to be that minister. The, um... The, uh, I think uh, being a Prime Minister is a big job. Um, trying to run another portfolio is just almost impossible at the same time. We've got time for a couple more questions uh, before the PM has to leave us. Um, the, um, there's a lady four in from the side there. Thank you. Hi, Thun. Um, it's great to see you here. My name is Sharon Sandhu from Kuala Lumpur. Um, so my question to you is, will Malaysia think about moving in a direction of allowing dual citizenship, um, especially knowing that a lot of Malaysians currently reside overseas for professional or personal reasons? Well, we, we think that you should make up your mind. <laughs> dual citizenship uh, means that you have no citizenship at all. You can be this or that, but in Malaysia, we want people to feel that Malaysia is their country, their only country, and they want to be. If they want to be citizens of other countries, they give up Malaysian citizenship. That is our feeling. That is generally the feeling in Malaysia. So unless, of course, uh, you make that an election issue and people vote for multiple uh, citizenship, then we will follow what the people want. But at this moment, uh, if we go to the polls and tell them that we stand for multiple citizenship, I'm, sure, I'm quite sure we'll lose. I think that's the voice of political experience speaking there. Uh, and there is a, a lady in the row in front, four from the side, who I meant to be four, actually. Yeah, thank you. Good morning, Prime Minister. I was wondering if you could speak on the Rohingya issue. The Rohingya in the Rakhine State in Myanmar, PM. Rohingya. Mm. 
Yeah, we feel that injustice must be something that we, the whole world should fight against. It is unjust to treat citizens or even non-citizens in your country unjustly. It's not right. Uh, here you have massacres being carried out against the Rohingyas. Ostensibly because uh, they were not citizens of Myanmar. But they have been there for the past 800 years. It was the British who decided to have Burma to include all these people also in Burma. The history is that there are people who have been living there a long time. Uh, so the Burmese government should accept them compared to Malaysia, where we have people of, uh, whose origins are from other countries. When we became independent, we accepted them as citizens of the country and they participate in the governments of the country. Every government would have people of all races, whether they are immigrants or indigenous people, they participate fully in the governance of the country. Uh, I do not understand why uh, the, the Rohingyas cannot be accepted by the Burmese uh, uh, as a part of the citizens of uh, Myanmar. Uh, of course, uh, Myanmar or Burmese people at independence actually expel a lot of Indians because uh, they seem to think that uh, Myanmar is only for Myanmarese people. Uh, but uh, the Indians also have been there a long time. They were doing all the business. But in Malaysia, most of the business is done by the Chinese. We accepted the Chinese. Now, this will be my last question for the PM. There's a gentleman there with his hand up, about four in from the side. Yeah, if I could pass him the microphone. Uh, good morning, John. Welcome to New York. Um, thank you for saving Malaysia from kleptocracy. My name is John Pang. I um, am with Columbia University and uh, uh, the International Crisis Group. I actually had to be here. I, I had to move here because of the kleptocracy. Yeah, but um, I wanted to ask you about um, um, your, your first administration. This is your second, the second Mahathir administration. The first Mahathir administration was characterized by a, a vision for Malaysia, but also uh, internationally. Malaysia led the world, actually, or, or was a leading player in East Asian regionalism, in Afro-Asian regionalism, and in South-South sort of multilateralism. In 1997, you proposed the East Asia Economic Caucus. Do you, don't you think that at this time, with rising protectionism, a sort of crumbling kind of uh, deep anxiety about regional multilateralism, global order, and so on, that as um, perhaps the eldest statesman of Asia, or actually the eldest statesman of the planet, <laughs> um, you, you might want to bring that idea back would you want to bring back the East, East Asian um, multilateralism, something in the form that you proposed back in 1997? I think it was we've got shot it. down. We've got it. Okay. Well, uh, that idea about an East Asian community uh, was because uh, Europe is a single uh, unit at that time. There, were, there was this uh, European community. And in North uh, America, they have NAFTA, the uh, community in, which includes the US, Canada, and Mexico. So everybody seems to be forming regional uh, organization to strengthen their voice in international fora. But in East Asia, uh, the countries were uh, basically uh, acting individually. And our voices were not strong. Uh, in fact, uh, when we go to the WTO, for example, uh, Malaysia would be there alone. We cannot fight against a delegation from the US, which would send about 200 experts to these meetings. So I thought that if we come together, the East Asian countries come together, they would have a stronger voice. But of course, uh, Mr. Baker at that time told Japan and uh, Korea, not to be involved in this East Asian 
uh, project. So we couldn't do that. But uh, later on, the president of South Korea suggested, suggested uh, the formation of ASEAN plus three, the Southeast Asian nation plus the three Northeast Asian nation. That is almost like uh, the East Asian community. I think it is good for regions to form such communities, but uh, we should not be exclusive. We should try and uh, work with each other. All the regions should work with each other because uh, in the so-called globalized world, you can't separate, they are separate yourself into distinct communities which are not uh, in confrontation with other communities. That is not good. But for the moment, I think the idea, there's a lot of talk about a uh, globalized world, but in fact, it is not globalized. Everybody protects his own nation. Uh, finishing on that point, um, Prime Minister, the East Asian Summit now exists, and uh, that borrowed some of your original conceptual vision. Is there something you think Malaysia, under your leadership, could do to take the uh, East Asian Summit idea further and turn it into more of a, an economic and even political reality? Well, it's going to be uh, quite difficult because ethnically we are quite different, people with different culture. But in one or two areas we can come together. For example, uh, we trade using the US dollar. We could have a token, a East Asian token or or currency that we use purpose only for trading. Uh, it's not to be used domestically, but we settle all trade uh, 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 differences uh, using this uh, East Asian currency for trading only. That could bring us together uh, quite well, but later on, if we, we begin to understand each other better, then we can go into other areas of cooperation. So, PM, Prime Minister Tun, you've been very um, generous with your time this morning. Um, when are the next Malaysian elections due? <laughs> <laughs> well, five years from, from now. So what are your plans? <laughs> <laughs> well, I have uh, promised that I will step down and give way to uh, Dr. Triano. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I think we've been uh, presented with an extraordinary uh, presentation from the new, old, old, new uh, uh, Prime Minister of Malaysia this morning. I think uh, Dr. Mahathir Mohamad has had an extraordinary political career so far and with a mission still to deliver for his country and for the region uh, for the future. Let's express our appreciation in the normal way.